and we're starting a new True Fire Live broadcast. Uh, this time, I am very excited that we have Jeff Mackerlane back in the studio. Uh, Jeff, um, shout out on the chat, by the way, if you have ever worked or are working on a Jeff Mackerlane course, if you're a True Fire student, odds are, especially if you dig the blues, that you've got a few of uh, Jeff's courses in your library. Um, man, he's got, let's see, 26 courses here at True Fire, which comprise 1,396 lessons, pretty much exclusively on the blues, even though Jeff is a pretty multi-dimensional player, awesome rock player, awesome blues rock player, and obviously a great, great blues player across all styles of the blues. Um, Jeff and I and True Fire go way back. I mean, way back. I think our first course, let's see, I wrote it down. Uh, 19, 2006 was our first project together. Maybe Jeff's first course, which was Blues Rock Evolution, uh, was one of our first 10 courses. And uh, we'll, we'll see if Jeff remembers what shooting like with True Fire was in just a moment. But I'll tell you what, he's one of my favorite people, one of my favorite players, and certainly one of my favorite educators on True Fire. Let's uh, interrupt this awesome stuff he's playing and talk with him a little bit. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Brad. How's it going? <laughs> How you doing? Pretty good. Let's flash back to 2006. Do you remember what it was like shooting in our studio back then? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I remember, um, wow, it was a long time ago. Um, I wasn't gray. <laughs> I had hair. Um, I was just a little bit gray. Right, we were a little bit gray. But I remember uh, it was, we had to turn off the, it was all in the same room. Yeah. There was a couch in front <laughs> that you admit, you keep on saying you didn't fall asleep, but I'm sure you fell asleep while I was filming. <laughs> and we had to turn off the air conditioning yeah. in between takes, and those lights were really hot. So if yeah. you watch that first video, is it uh, Blues Rock Evolution? <laughs> I'm a little sweaty. <laughs> maybe if you poor choices and sideburns, yeah. maybe, but hey. <laughs> well, I remember we were all in one room. We didn't have a control room. We did have to turn the air conditioner off. Allie would be logging all of the takes, right? <laughs> uh, sitting under the hottest of the hot lights, yeah. uh, running cameras. I'd be on the other side, not even sure what I was doing at that point. And, um, they were some, you know, when you think back, really brutal sessions. I, I didn't feel that way then, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but given, you know, how we roll today, it was kind of like going from black and white to color. Right? Sure. Um, then we'd take the tapes and we'd have to capture it in real time, right? <laughs> Look for Ali's annotation of, okay, it's take three or take four. Find that one mm -hmm. and then edit it. But... Um, those were the good old days, I guess, right? It was fun. Yeah. So um, well, it was cutting edge back then. You know? The what? It was cutting edge back then. It was cutting edge, <laughs> and you know, you were one of uh, very few people. It was really you, Jeff Sheets, David Hamburger, Mimi Fox. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys really kind of believed in the technology. Uh, it was know. David Hamburger who brought me in. Yeah, David yeah, yeah. did. Yeah. Shout now, to Dave. I fell asleep during his sessions without a doubt. There was a very comfortable, you know, leather couch. But you know how David talks, you know. I know nothing. Very, yeah, very monotonic. I don't know if that's a word. But um, I did fall asleep a couple times with him. Um, but I swear I never fell asleep during your. Okay. I was just resting. All that's right. all just I resting my eyes. Just resting. <laughs> Thank God Ali was uh, taking care of business up there, right? Right. Um, so, man... Um, such a large library, you know? It's um, amazing when I think about it. You've covered so many awesome topics from, you know, uh, comping, rhythm, a lot of different styles. Mm -hmm. um, what were your favorite courses, you know, older courses to... Well, I think the thing that really started me all off was the 50 Blues Licks. You know, that was the first... Yeah. I think was that one of the first iPad apps, too? Yeah, one and of the first iPad apps, one of the first uh, OS apps, mm -hmm. 
and I'm pretty sure it was our very first 50 licks course. It, it was. And, All uh, time uh, bestseller, too. It, it yeah. is, I, I'm happy to say. I you know. know. And uh, as I smile. But what was, <laughs> co- what was cool about that course was, uh, well, I mean, it changed the, the trajectory of, of how I taught and what teaching was for me, you know what I mean? Um, you know this new this new method of of delivering information to people that you guys jumped on, which was such a such a cool thing, you know. And then to show it to people like, hey, here I am on an iPad, and you can, you know. And then that technology's gotten so much better. But uh, I still like that course, you know. Like I listen back to it, and I love when people, uh, you know, get I still get emails about it, which is great. Yeah. I got one recently. Somebody asked if I was using a Dumble on that course. I'm like. No, it was a pod 2.0. <laughs> you know? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Kind of funny. We were somewhat limited in our kind of studio equipment roundup there. Yeah. But, you know, um, actually, the guys just showed me a report yesterday that really blew my mind. So, you know, 2006 was really the first year we started to do these kind of interactive video courses. We now have probably 400 courses in the master library. Right. Um, do you know that every single one of those courses, except five of them, I won't mention which mm-hmm. five, but literally every single one have also, you know, been sold in 2018. Wow. So, you know, one of the things you and I talked about very early on, you know, is um, that, you know, we want to really focus on, let's call it timeless music topics you know and if you think about 50 blues licks for example you know whenever is that going to get dated you know people will be playing blues 100 years from now and those licks are you know a a vocabulary that will be used uh, that is used today was used then and will be used in 100 years sure what's your feeling about that well it's it's great you know i mean i think um you know, like blues and, and rock, to me, is timeless, you know, maybe not to, to younger people. I don't know exactly sure. But, um, you know, I, I think it, 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 it being able to document all these things mm-hmm. and hopefully explain them to people in a way that makes sense, uh, I think is important. And I, I mean, for me, the music is timeless. I think Muddy Water sounds as fresh to me now as it did before I was born, you know what I mean? So that old, when I hear it, I still think it's the coolest stuff, or even Robert Johnson. So for me, blues, or even Zeppelin, you know, I hear it, and I still think it's the coolest thing in the world, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, to be, to be uh, I think some of those courses hopefully will live on for a long time, just because of the sure. it, it, just stuff you must know. And, you know, while it may not be, you know, a popular genre today, mm-hmm. specifically today, sure. um, you know, it... It goes round in circles, doesn't it? You know, I, so. um, I mean, I can think of several times over the past several decades where blues, you know, came into vogue again. You know, yeah. it's it's definitely not going any place. Jazz isn't going any place, and frankly, classic rock and hard rock like Led Zeppelin and some of those guys, you know, sure. well, keeps bands, coming back. Yeah, and there's bands now that you know that come around and that have that same kind of influence in them. You know, so for yeah. me, it's just, you know, I, as a you know, mostly known as a blues guitar player at, at True Fire, but I see myself more as like a rock guitar player, a blues <laughs> exactly. rock guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then fusion-y and stuff. But but the reason why I enjoy teaching the blues is because there's so much to talk about it, and it, it's educated. Before I knew it, I was, you know, uh, growing up listening to, uh, whether it was Van Halen or, or you know, uh, Randy Rhodes, I was a big fan, and Michael Schenker, guys like this, super blues-influenced. And then, you know, Zeppelin and going back and realizing that those guys listen to Howlin' Wolf, and, and getting steeped in that music actually made all my other playing better. So a lot of the concepts I worked on in, in getting to be a b- better blues player helped me be a much better jazz player and rock player and a fusion player and things like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of blues in everything, isn't there? Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, like, it just doesn't sound right if it doesn't have some blues in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. know, I mean, there's certain music that, you know, if you throw it in, yeah. But um, for me, yeah, I just always lean that way. It's always like home base. Yeah. And uh, one of these days, we're going to get you to do a rock course. Sure. All right, we'll do a rock <laughs> you know, course. Yeah, Jeff's yeah. a great rock player. So let's talk about what we're doing here in this session. First of all, what do you think of the new studio digs here? Oh, man, it's great. You know, if you guys could see what I'm seeing, it's, it's a whole 
recording studio going on with these motorized cameras, and it's great. And I've been here since the get-go, and yeah. now um, we finally have the, you have the control room done, and yeah. it's, it's really pro and super yeah, great. Yeah, we had, um, I'm bragging now, but we searched high and low for, you know, a badass studio architect and wound up with a, you know, kind of a steely Dan, you know, authorized guy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wes Lushow, and mm -hmm. he's done a magnificent job. And, you know, shout out to anybody and everybody that ever happens to be, you know, in our neck of the woods. You know, you're always welcome. Come check it out. Come say hey. Come get a T-shirt. You and know, you visitors the, get swag here. You got the best espresso maker this side. Of oh, the my God. We waited a long <laughs> time for that one. Ali ordered that from Italy. Yeah. And, you know, it was delivered by slow boat. You know, <laughs> I don't know. They must have gone around the horn or something. Yeah. Okay. But we finally got it. it. Makes a good cup of espresso. Yeah. Okay. So you're here uh, this week doing three courses, two take fives, mm -hmm. one is um, something we've been talking about and really anxious to get in the library on uh, diminished blues, right? Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about the use of a diminished scale in blues playing. Okay, well, I mean, you know, all cards and table is really the, the guy who brought it to my attention. I think most of us were talking about is Robin Ford. And uh, in, in, in the way I'm describing it on this course, which was, uh, I think for many guys, uh, he was really influential, you know, I mean, for many guys, tons of guys, you know, the, the modern, quintessential modern blues guitar player, I think, without sounding too kiss a, <laughs> kissing up, but uh, it's just true. So Nothing um, wrong with kissing up to Robin Ford. No, right? you know, and uh, he's a good friend, and so we've, we've talked a lot about the diminished stuff, and um, it's kind of cool. So when, for me, what I, I always had a hard time I knew what the scale was, but I didn't really know how to use it. And um, when when he talks about it, you hear like you know jazz guys or Schofield, and these guys use that same kind of sound. Uh, I knew the sound, but I had a hard time making it work for me. So I kind of broke it down to what I see sort of mathematically. You know what those guys would do, or Robin uses specifically, is on a on a, a blues going from the one to the four chord, right? So you got your one chord, say A seven. Then they're going to add in that diminished sound the four chord and um what's cool about the diminished scale uh is it's it's symmetrical it's a cool it's a cool lot but in the course i just kind of focus in on the top four strings of the guitar because the diminished scale is i have some of you guys have tried to cat figure it out it can be really overwhelming because there's so much stuff going on it's really deep and there's eight notes in the scale it can diminished theory gets really really heavy so for me that got really confusing so the idea where Robin uses it and uh, where a lot of people ask me about is how do I throw that, those kind of licks in? So it, it's specifically on bar four of a 12 bar blues. So if I'm thinking like, you know, here's the mesh, right? Right, so that little chord there, it's um, a seven with a 13 and a flat nine. But if we look at this diminished scale, which is a half step, whole step scale off of the root. So all it is is half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step. And it always was annoying when people said to me, oh, all it is is just half step, whole step, you know, which, which is like, okay. So now here's the thing. Like if, if I say, if I start on A, it's just, if we do the fingering, let's start on the G because it makes a lot of sense. It's just one, three, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, one, two, four. Right? So... When you're getting into the sound of that scale, first of all, you can just work off a of fingering, which is fine. You know, people get like, yes, you want to know the notes. It's super important to educate yourself and understand all that. But off the bat, you just want to get it under your fingers. And sometimes the theory and all these other things will follow later. You know, it you, you, doesn't mean you have to fully understand exactly what you're doing before you can use it, right? A lot of times with guitar, we can use a fingering. So, um, one thing that I talk about in the course is just you can map it out, right? So if you think about eighth notes, so say like, you know, uh, two and three and four. So I'm thinking one, two, three, four, oh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and one. 
Okay, so when you, the big key is to start it, and, but more importantly, end it at the right spot. So you want to end it, and we're going to bunch of the, the licks and the examples in the course are really that. I'm ending that diminished lick on the downbeat of bar five. So we're in A blues, I'm going to end it on the downbeat of bar five, which is the D9 chord or D7 chord. So I'm going to choose the C, which is a chord tone. So if you even just look, there's my chord, right? So what's kind of fun with the eighth notes, just to get it under your fingers, is I'm just going to go on a downbeat. So one, two, three, four. Two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and right, right there. So if you practice that kind of thing, like write it out or think mathematically, you're ahead of the game because for a long time I was just trying to figure out, you know, shot in the dark, trying to make this thing work. And then I realized, well, no, there's something very specific going on. So, so you... Um you're resolving it to the note C of oh, the four chord. Yeah, right? which is the flatted seventh, which is a chord tone of the four chord. So are there other notes besides the flat seven sure. where you can any resolve chord. it to? Yeah, any any other, chord tone. Any chord tone will work. Yeah. So here's a little thing that will work every time, which is kind of interesting. Um, if you just work off of that eighth note, right? We're just going to do eighth notes. And if I start the diminished scale on a chord tone of your four chord. Okay, does that make sense? If I start to diminish scale on the four, on the a chord tone of the four chord, D7 is spelled D, F sharp, A, C. So let's start on the A. So I do one and two and three and four and one. It always, it'll end on the same note that you started it on. So if you start on a chord tone of the four chord and you do this eighth note thing, it will end on the chord tone of Very the four cool. chord. Very cool, yeah. So, you know, these are all ways to get you to that point. You know what I'm saying? You want to practice this. This is the kind of stuff like, if you're just going to try to whip this out on a gig, good luck to you. <laughs> this, is, this is practice room stuff. This is like, I got to spend my time and I got to chart it out. And once I charted it out and I, you know, transcribed some Robin stuff and Schofield and like Scott Henderson, these guys who I love, um, Michael Landau, we do these diminished kind of ideas. And they all sound very different doing it, you know. Um, it was all the same kind of thing. You know, it's always like diminished to the core tone. Because it's, it's just about tension and release. So you're adding in a tension, but uh, I didn't hear it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was just, you know, without saying I'm trying to disingenuous. I'm not like a real natural, I think, on the instrument. I think I worked really hard. And if I, if I see a problem, and as an instructor, I need to be able to explain it to people. But for me, I was like, I'm not getting this. Hold on. Let me just analyze it. And, you know, that's what I did at Berkeley and kind of go back to that idea and look at the notes and... And write a lick or two. And yeah, I love how, um, you know, we've, we've talked about this for a long time, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and the challenge was, and we've had, including Robin Ford, mm -hmm. a lot of educators try to explain the use of the diminished scale, sure. you know, in a blues. And, you know, while their demonstrations sound great, you know, you're still kind of left, well, I, I don't quite understand, okay, you know. Yeah. Like, you want a really pedantic explanation of it. And, sure. You know, we talked about that. And I think you did a phenomenal job on, on this course. And, you know, it's it's black and white, you know? Mm -hmm. You start here, you count there, you do the, the math, yeah. you practice it, and then, you you know, you get it under your fingers. Yeah. Let's, uh, can you call a track? Sure. Um, uh, and that... demonstrate it now. Sure, the bit by bit, Tommy. So I'm just going to be, I'm going to, do exactly what I said, but very simply, you know, I'm just going to play. It's an A blues, and I'm going to throw it in before the four chord. <laughs> All right, I don't hear any track. There we go. Here we go, and... Uh, oh! <laughs> Live TV! I'll get it this time. Right? 
try again, right? So. So the same thing. Right? Cool. So that time you played a little quicker. Yeah, so let's just talk about... What's the math of that? Yeah, okay, so um, I love that I totally flubbed a live TV. Um, that's what it's all about, oh, yeah, man. that's great. Um, okay, so what I did on the fast lick was it's 16th notes. Right, so I just double the time, right? So I worked out, okay, this is gonna work mathematically. So my downbeat on the four chord was this F sharp. I wanted to shoot for that because I have to play double the note. So I worked out a lick, you know, that's the thing I think that. So you play twice as many twice notes, as many notes on the yeah. diminished scale, yeah. right? And wound up on the F sharp, F sharp, which okay. is the third of the four cool. chords. So now the the theory before of like starting on the F sharp and going down that doesn't quite work because we're doubling the notes and right. you'd have to start higher up. Right. I'm just trying to stick into a fingering. Yeah. So what I did was um, thought of a line, and if you write it out, if you think sixteenth notes is one e and a two e and a three e and a four e, and, so I could think well one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and and one. You know what I mean? So I would have to target that note. So um, that takes a little bit of thinking ahead of time. But any of this stuff is going to take some thought. Now, one thing that I'm doing that is really key to this sound, I think, is to not start it on the downbeat. Okay? So that sounds kind of... You know, if we go back to that eighth note feel, right? So if I went back to that, you know... Um, they know, kind of, but, but, but. so if I drop the first eighth note and start on an upbeat, so I'm going to think, okay, one and two and three and four and one, all right? But now I'm going to just drop that first eighth note, one and two and three and four and uh, so one. Okay, so sometimes you have to say it and play it hard. So if you hear that on the off, it's much cooler immediately. Yeah. Definitely. That's a Robin Fordish kind of thing also, oh, totally. right? Yeah, one hundred percent. He rarely starts on the downbeat. Rarely. Uh, right. But but if you listen to anybody, you know, most jazz guys don't mm -hmm. really. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh it's just part of the, the genre. Yeah. And everything in the downbeat can sound really predictable, you mm -hmm. know. So you could end on the downbeat, but starting on an upbeat. And as I ex explained in the course, so if you're rhythmically challenged at times like like I am, um I just kind of do like a ghost on a down pick. Nice. So I'm going one and two and three and four and one, right? So they don't have to get the click. You can just kind of do a down, a fake down pick. And I'm right into the actual line. So same thing with the 16th note. Now I've practiced that, so it's like... You know, and then I've run over that lick a million times. It's a mm -hmm. pretty cliche one. Well, here, here's what's cool about the course. I mean, yeah. absolutely slam dunk. You nailed it. And, uh, you know, a anybody that wants to incorporate the diminished scale, mm -hmm. right, or some diminished lines into their blues and get that kind of outside, inside kind of vibe, yeah. um, you did the thinking for them. <laughs> they need to do right. the practice time, yeah. okay? But you did the thinking. And, um, you know, I have to thank you for taking the time to really... My think pleasure. that through, work that all out, and make it so easy for we mortal players, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, to make that happen. How about you, uh, do you have another track you can just play over, and throw some diminished stuff in, and then we'll move on to the next course? Sure. Well, one kind of fun thing that I threw at the end of the course was um, I'm a big Miles Davis fan. And to me, that's that kind of a uh, mixture of major and minor, a flat third, natural third, that the diminished scale really covers quite... Uh, it's, it, if you run a track, I call it miles. And what we're doing here is kind of the band's just vamping on sort of like an E7 sharp 9, kind of. 
leaving it very ambiguous on the thirds. So I'm just going to play the scale, like just noodle around a bit. So you hear the sound of diminished uh, in its natural habitat. <laughs> Yeah, I love that kind of thing, and you know, Scott Henderson, I highly recommend checking him out if you want to get super deep into that kind of, but Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, We Want Miles with Mike Stern, mm -hmm. huge record for me, and that's that kind of sound where it's all open and... Cool. Yeah. Awesome job on that course, man. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the next one, I wanted to share with you where some people are t tuned in from. We've got Italy, San Jose, Fort Pierce, uh, Germany, Houston, Minneapolis, uh, Hawaii. You know, it, it always blows my mind when we do one of these live broadcasts, you mm -hmm. know, because you got, I mean, some of these folks are in the middle of their night, for goodness sake. Well, I know. You know? Yeah. Um, you've got a lot of shout outs here. I'll let you read through them later. Okay. And a lot of guys that have worked with your stuff way back to Blues Rock Evolution. Mm hmm. I see John Celestion, a diehard True Fire fan, is uh, uh, tuned in. I think he's actually stateside, although he's living in China now. Wow. Okay. Um, and uh, a few other of your friends are tuned in. Cool. So let's talk about the second take five, which is on comping the blues, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's a big thing also. And all of your rhythm courses seem to be, you know, you know, they're very popular. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you love playing rhythm guitar. You love comping, uh, especially the blues. Talk about why you love that so much. Well, you know, I, it came from the, just growing up being a lead player, playing in metal bands, and, you know, everything was about lead guitar and shredding and all this kind of stuff, uh, which I'm glad I have, you know, growing up being an Yngwie fanatic and things like that. But, um, you know, for blues for me, it kind of ended when I was just playing the, just the boogie-woogie stuff. And then I watch good players, good blues players, and go, wow, I'm completely missing the boat. And, uh, you know, it's the, the biggest cliche. Like, most of the time you spend playing rhythm guitar. And the if you're playing in a rock band, you're playing a part usually. But if you're playing in a blues band or a jazz thing, your comping is part of the music. It's a living thing, right? It's a part that it, it shouldn't remain static through the whole song. So there's lots of... Uh, it's To me, it's just as creative as playing lead. And then locking into the rhythm section of a band uh, and being a part of this music that's going on and locking in with the groove and playing with great players. That's a ton of fun. And then it's a challenge to me to play cool and hip stuff. So so let's demonstrate, like, what are we doing on comping? One of the things that I loved is in the primer, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about six essential chord voicings. Yeah, yeah. What are they? Um, Okay, uh, you, you may know some of them, but uh, we can put them all together. Um, so the first thing, we'll, we'll do that same bit by bit track, all right? So we're going to play an A. Um, so I've got an A9 with no root. 
You guys might know that as a first, you know, Stormy Monday. Yeah. That's A9 with no root. And then there's D9, right? So, and then back to the A9. And then you have your E9, D9, uh, sorry, uh, D9, yeah, and A9. Okay, so you can kind of wear out that register fairly quickly. So we're going to go up to this one, which is an A13. And it's a little tricky to get your fingers on at first. And just kind of thinking about where your root is, and your root is on the second string uh, with your second finger. Or you can just see it right here on the fifth string. So that's uh, fingering number three, chord number three. And here we have back, to, now we're going to D9, so we're going to use that other fingering that we used on the A. And we're going to go up to E. Okay, so let's going to stick for that for a little bit on the blues. So now we're going to go up top. I'm going to play this A7 voicing. And uh, my root is on the second string. I kind of see this one as off of your standard old A7 fingering like this, but I bring it up to the top four strings, put the E on top. I'm going to play a D9 right up top like this. Right now my E chord is an E9, which is uh, the first chord from Kiss by Prince, right? Here. Right, so this is E9 right there. Okay, so we have these six voicings that really kind of uh, cover the whole register of the guitar pretty much and give you a lot of interesting stuff to play. So let's just roll the track. I'm going to do one after another. You will probably wouldn't do that for real playing, but I'll just, you know, each roll the three chorus. Let's yeah. see it. <laughs> Coming. This course, you know, like diminished, if you want to step up, you know, your comping or your rhythm game, mm -hmm. I, I think this was also a really great job on putting together. It's really an accelerated study program if you think about it. You sure. know, you show them some very cool voicings, you put them to work over five tracks. Mm -hmm. We start with, let's say, some simpler, basic ways of applying those chords and um, work our way up to some very cool, let's say, more advanced, you know, feels and yeah. patterns. Um, I got some questions for you. Sure. 
Uh, back to the diminished, uh, <laughs> folks want to know. Uh, I told you this. I know. Thing. <laughs> this can be big, man. Well, um, what? Go well, ahead. you know, I, I work with Robin Ford a lot. We do workshops together, yeah. just dojos and stuff. And yeah. is that... Oh, and, it's the a, number one thing, <laughs> yeah, man. You know, I, any questions, but, you know, besides you know, diminished? But, and, you know, I love Robin as much as you do. Yeah. We work together. He's a good buddy of mine. I remember the first workshop we did with him before his very first session, huh? which... Uh, Jeff came in actually and co-produced with us, which was, you know, um, you made such a big contribution that really cooked, kicked off a great relationship with Robin. We'll, sure. we'll share where that okay, led yeah, to, yeah, okay. okay great, yeah. Um, in a minute, but, uh, y you were there, you saw people, you know, that's what they wanted to know. Okay. Yeah. The diminished scale, where do you, da, da. Mm -hmm. and he sort of kind of left him as confused at the end of his expo as he did in the beginning. Um, and, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think he will thank you as well for that take five. <laughs> so the question is, what diminished scale are you playing over that A blues? Okay, great. Yeah, exactly. In that example. Sure. And I talk about in the course, there's, uh, sometimes it's called uh, most commonly the half step, whole step diminished. So we just step back onto that again. What it is, it's the half step, whole step, starting off of the root. So um, the root of, of A of the A. So chord. it's an A A half step, whole step, diminished chord. Okay. And so just what we're doing, we're superimposing some tension before the change. So we're just like I said before, like A seven. Then we're getting in this this sound of like this this. So we're we're making the chord, we're adding more tension, and a diminished scale is a really good scale to do that with. So I'm playing A half step, whole step, diminished on the A chord, and then I just go to a D blue stuff after that, you know? But it's just um, A, if you look even on one string, you know, A, it, it's half step to B flat, whole step to C, half step to D flat, whole step to E flat, to E, and it continues but once they, like I said, if you look at the fingering, so it's you know one three four one two four one three four one two four. And it, that that looks like a pretty easy fingering too. It's right well right there I, in position. If we're know? back into it, yeah. nice. so the diminished scale parts of it. Well, a blues scale parts of it is contained in a diminished scale, so that's pretty hip too. Like so if I think about a blues lick. Right? That, that's a blues scale lick. Like, that kind of a thing. But it's also a diminished lick. So if you look at, um, you can almost look at diminished if, as like, uh, I'd say altered, but we've changed or added to a blues scale as well. You know, like, so there are, there are a bunch of ways to look at it because seeing it as this, what I try to get to is you don't, don't see it as a crazy odd entity because it goes super deep. And I just want you to start at the very beginning and then you can start going deep diving on all the things that exist in a diminished scale, which is, you know, I'm still working through all of it. And then I hear somebody play some great diminished stuff. I'm like, I never thought of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's super deep, but it's a half step, whole step diminished. If you just think about playing that, and sometimes just playing the scale sounds great. Just like I said before, just go right down the scale. And as long as you end on a chord tone, you're going to probably be pretty good. Right. And that's, a, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to discourage anybody from diving deep into any topic. Yeah. But really what we've been waiting for is, okay, what scale? Show me the notes. What's the math? Where do I start and yeah. where do I resolve it to? And, um, you know, you just lifted the hood on you know, Robin, Scott Henderson, you know, yeah. Schofield, um, just awesome job on that. Um, I have a correction here. I must have misspoke earlier and said we had 400 courses or something like that. We actually have now 750 courses. Okay. It um, sounded a little light when you said that, yeah. <laughs> it did sound yeah. like, I think I, I had stuck in numbers from like seven years I think I have 300 of them, right? You know? um, <laughs> but I nailed your numbers, right. okay? 26. Uh, God, 26 courses. Not including 1,396 these? individual lessons. 1,396 individual lessons. Unreal, man. Um, okay. Also, we have more uh, folks. Yeah. Um, I want to chime in now from 
Barcelona. Oh. I love Barcelona. I've never been. I love Barcelona, man. Uh, Great Britain, Canada, New Orleans, and Sweden. Sweet. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's move on to In the Jam, because I want to make sure okay. we have enough time to talk about some of the cool things that you're doing, all okay. right? Yeah. So one of, um, you can't really see it, uh, you know, in your field of view here, but the new studio features a much wider, uh, let's call it, uh, back wall. And uh, we've optimized it to be able to do more shoots with several musicians, you know, on the set, um, particularly to be able to do more of these in the jams, you know, which we, we haven't done a new one in a while because we've been building the new studio. So um, we have two types of in the jams, one where we bring in a whole band and Jeff's going to do one of those as well and bring down some of his New York buds, you know, uh, some killer players that he plays with up there. But also we have a version of In The Jam where the artist will bring in some uh, stems or tracks, bass and drum tracks, and that's what Jeff's done here. So um, for those of you that are familiar with In The Jam or, or and those of you who aren't, you know that um, you can control what video angle you look at you know, there are usually 10 video jams, we call them. You can, con you're kind of in the director's seat, can select the angle. Do you want to see the rhythm guitar? Do you want to see the lead guitar? Uh, do you want to see the drums? The, some of the stuff that's going on. So, sure. you know, Jeff uh, has taught for many, many years and uh, obviously is a great teacher, but, you know, I've always felt and we've always talked about, man, you know, you're such a great player too. And um, so, you know, you came, you did that thing with Robin Ford. You guys got, you know, very close uh, buddies. And, um, you know, that led to Robin started his own label. And of all the people in the universe, you know, that he could do his first record on, his first record label with, he, he chose you. And I think that's uh, a great testimony to you know, your musicality and your prowess on the instrument. Talk about the new record, please. Sure. Well, you know, the, the history, we met uh, here. Well, we'd met in workshops prior, but we hit it off here and became friends and, you know. Um, and then uh, I, I started working with him, with him at his dojo, and we played together and, you know, lots of you know, a few moments where he looked at me like, damn, I had no idea, you know, which was kind of fun, you know, when you're, He's one of my heroes. And so, you know, I'm not going to dismiss any of this. It's like, you know, I, I listen to talk to your daughter to change my life, you know? <laughs> so, um, to, you know, to have him be a friend and then, you know, work together at teaching. And that's really been fun, too, because we work well together, you know. So when he said, uh, we're just hanging out one day, he's like, hey, man, you ever thought about doing a record together? And I'm like, what? You know, so, sure. Yeah, he said that to he you. He brought it up to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he brought it up to me. So I was pretty shocked. And then he just said, you know, I would like to produce it. And um, I said, are you going to play on it? He said, yeah. So, uh, the, you know, the record's Jeff McElroy featuring Robin Ford. You know, I got the, I have it in my backpack, the cover, so I could show it to you. But, uh, and uh, he, what turns out is uh, he wrote four of the songs. I wrote five. And he plays on everything. And we both take solos. It's kind of like, you know, the way it comes across, it's sort of a duo record. You know, we're both playing together um he graciously we have two vocal uh, tracks on it with uh kendra chantrell singing she was on american idol sounds great and what was really awesome about her about those tunes was oh here it is thank you it's not thanks man it's not quite out yet um but it will be out in february so it's killer too i thanks. mean just just amazing. And you do a lot of touring with him now. Are, aren't you touring? Are you, well, something's going to happen shortly, right? Not a lot. Well, we, we did a bunch of dates in California, yeah. which was great with uh, Jimmy Haslip and Toss Pano. Mm -hmm. So that was awesome as well. No slouches. No slouches whatsoever. <laughs> and, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I was so... How do you, I can't believe, like, when we did the gig, it was like he gave me 40% of the solos and things. It was a duo gig, and certain songs you walked off stage, you got yeah, it. Yeah, pretty, so pretty generous. Very and... generous. It's just been so great. And um, so I'm excited, excited about the record. We've got some dates that we're planning to do in the spring together mm -hmm. to kind of promote the record a bit more. 
We have and, a few workshops coming up to and see. Yeah, he calls on you all the time now to come and do a workshop with yeah. him. And uh, it's a great combination, you know. Nice. You know, they say... Um, well, can I say one yeah. thing? There's Go no ahead. blues on the record. Really? There's not a blues tune on it. Nice. Yeah. So we kind of did that on purpose, you know. Yeah. And um, we had a discussion about it. Is it blues? Like, yeah, nah, let's not do blues. You know, which I, then if you know him, he's just like, okay, that means that that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and I really appreciated it because it gives me a chance to show uh, this whole other side of my playing mm-hmm. that most people don't really know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he is an awesome songwriter as well, you know? He, oh, yeah. And he loves, you know, the song craft. So the combination of his tunes, your tunes, it's really a very special record. And we're, yeah. we're going to put our heads together and figure out a way that, uh, you know, the, True Fire community can yeah, get, in on, yeah, get in on it somehow. Yeah, okay? Okay. sounds great. Yeah. Um, you know, they say, be careful of meeting your heroes, you mm-hmm. know, I- implying that you might be disappointed. And um, that's certainly not the case with Robin, also a hero of mine, you know. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, I have to say, I don't know, is it the music business? Is it a True Fire thing? I don't know what it is. But, man, I've never been disappointed with all the guys that, you know, you and I get to meet, you know, Grissom, mm-hmm. another hero of mine. I know you do a lot of work with him as well, and yeah, you're good, good buddies, friend, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, it's a great, well, it's a great as community. I, as I know? told you, you know, Matt Schofield's friend, and he yeah. texted me saying he's never had a better experience in all his years <laughs> in the music business than he I has know. with you guys. I know. And I know, I mean, I tell everybody that, and anybody who's listening, I know it sounds kind of, I don't, it's totally true. It's, I know. And, and when you, uh, people, Ask me what's it like to work for True Farm. I'm like, it's like family. It's just been great. Yeah, yeah. and it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, we, of course, we love to hear it, you know, and, but we don't think twice about it. Like, no, you know, at guys all. come in, we work with guys, we have a great time. I mean, you know, we have to pinch ourselves. Like, we get to do this every day. <laughs> it's crazy, yeah. man. And I, yeah, I feel um, the same way <laughs> coming down here. I it's just crazy. This, you know? yeah. So uh, let's talk. So we talk about the tour, the workshops, the new album, mm-hmm. uh, Gear. You're playing, um, you know, uh, last shoot you worked with Tuttle, and I love I still do. Tuttle, just uh, guitars. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've. Everyone you've brought down, I had to Buy, go get and get one for the studio as well. I mean, they are, you know, if you haven't checked out a Tuttle, I will tell you, please yeah. go check out a Tuttle because they're magnificent. Yeah. And um, I think we've all heard of Collins. Mm-hmm. I, I, I haven't played that particular instrument before you brought it in. Mm-hmm. You know, fabulous. Talk about it. Sure. Well, um, I, I like, uh, well, Michael's guitars, and he does make some non-Fender style things, but I particularly love his Fender style. And I love 335s, but they're kind of big. They're difficult to tour with, you know what I mean? And walking around the subway, like, they're just big. So I don't really like to use them that much. Um, and uh, I like, I play Les Pauls a lot, too. Um, but uh, I found 335s to be particularly spotty. You know, like, I, I, hard to find a really good one, I've, in my experience. So uh, I was at um, Tom Crandall Guitars in New York City, and they had the uh, Collings I-35, and I picked it up, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, like, it was just everything I was looking for. It's a smaller body, but it looks cool. It doesn't look odd. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes the smaller yeah. body ones look a little yeah. weird. It's really a classic thing, and... Um, so I really I was flipped out over it, and you know I I called David Grissom, who's a good friend, and he knows he does works with Collings. He's like, yeah, just give him a buzz, you know, and uh, and it's, he particularly loved this model too, and uh, I called him up, and they were like, oh, we'd love to work with you, and it was a, it was a fun moment of like, oh, we know we know who you are, and I'm like, really, you know, <laughs> you know, through we see all your instructional stuff, you know what I yeah. mean? So um, yeah, that, so I, they made it possible for me to get one of these. Um, so I have a, I chose their 50s neck profile, which is a little fatter. Uh, they put in custom frets for me, for me, the 6105s, which I like a taller fret. Mm-hmm. And these are the throwback pickups. And I've, I've been working with throwback for a long time. And, and uh, they are expensive, you know, all this stuff is. Um, but, you know, when you, when you get, like, when you get, I work with Two Rock, fortunately, the greatest people, Eli and Mac, you know, just been so supportive and great. And, uh, you know, just talk to Rob about Robin for a second, talking about his Dumble, and he, you know, he's playing Marshalls, which I love. 
He's like, yeah, but you know, when he's like talking about his dumbbell, like I just, there's something when you get that kind of amp. And my old super lead sounds great for rock, but I found it to be a little, you know, it does that one thing spectacularly mm -hmm. well, but I mm -hmm. found it hard to kind of do other things. Mm -hmm. So I started working with two rock and I got that first classic signature reverb and I was like, oh, like every, just everything felt different. Mm -hmm. You know, my playing, it just made me a better player. It doesn't hide your faults, but there's a, it just kind of sings. It makes playing so much more pleasurable, mm -hmm. you know, and I played the Robbins amp and it's the same feeling to me of just this like, uh, this is just such a joy, you mm -hmm. know, like it just sounds so good. And the funny thing is an aside, I play way cleaner than I ever did when I'm playing my two rock. Like here I'm playing through the uh, super reverb, which is cool, but I find I get a little, I rely on the amp, like a pedal a little more mm -hmm. with the two rock. It just kind of blooms all those corny mm -hmm. expressions which are totally true mm -hmm. and i found that you find when i got that amp things like the two rock i mean the uh the the, the uh, throwbacks really made the difference i could hear it you know suddenly I was like oh mm -hmm. wow there's all this high end going on yeah yeah so you know you be careful so, in a certain you know, way we don't have one yet in nope. the studio. Hint, hint. We'll get on it. <laughs> Call yeah. the boys. Okay. Well, you got a few um, guys in two rock. You got, uh, you got some other cool people coming down. Who absolutely. Are two rock people, and you got. We Matt. need one. Yeah. Um, another question we have is, you know, whether you buy a seat for your guitars when you fly. Oddly enough, we were just talking about this yesterday. I'm going to go grab. Okay. It. Sure. Okay. Hang on. Well, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, it's just, everybody's like, well, by law, you're allowed to bring your guitar on a plane, and yeah, and uh, that's not, you can't rely on that. Um, so when I'm flying with, with my Tuttles, which are Fender style, I'm a little less worried, you know, because um, maple necks and things, so I sometimes bring it in a gig bag, but doing international travel, and I just get so tired of worrying that, there's my phone number in there, okay, <laughs> um, is I... Uh, through Collings, and I bought a Carlton case, and it was actually David Grissom. We were in Italy together playing a gig, and um, he brought his, his guitar in a, Col in a Carlton case, and it's fiberglass, and I don't worry about it at all. I just, it, it, is, it is not inexpensive, but I figured, you know, if you got a great guitar like this, it's custom made for the guitar, and I got tired of worrying, like just the stress, and if, what well, you do, you get two gig at the other side, and the headstock snapped off, or yeah. it's cracked, or... Um, so even now for like the Tuttles or, you know, any kind of Strat thing, I'll, uh, I have some hard cases, like pretty good flight cases, like SKB ones. But for this, uh, what I like, it's, it's kind of form fitting. It's small. It's no bigger than my gig bag, actually. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. um, it, first of all, it's a beautiful case. I yeah, was, it's cool. We <laughs> were talking about it in the, in the car on the way to the Great hotel. Great quality, yeah, yeah. And uh, it is super sturdy. And yeah. the other little trick you shared, um, which is, you know, pretty common, is artists will take their, even if they have a checkable guitar, mm -hmm. yeah. they'll take it to the gate. Yeah. If they're lucky enough to be able to bring it on board, they will. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, they'll check it right there at the gate, which ensures that it gets on the plane, right? Right. So, I mean, what happened, for my Les Pauls, I've got that big clamshell SKB thing. Yeah. Which, you know, you're rolling that up to the gate. There's no way you're going to get it. Right. They might not even let you get it up to the gate. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> so, for my, my strats... It does guitar, look a little on this. So. Yeah. You know, yeah. It looks like, it looks like you know, someone's like, you're coming yeah. back from war? Like, right. you know, yeah. So, um... What I wanted to do, because the, the problem is if you check your guitar, it may not actually make it to your gig. So I want it to be, I know that it goes on the plane with me. So I, I travel light as I can, or I'll just check my bag. And uh, so one of the reasons um, for my Tuttles, I have a, you have actually the same case over there, like a form-fitting SKB, mm -hmm. that if I gate check it, I feel pretty good about it. If they make me check it, it'll be fine. Go into, you know. And then um, for this, I needed something as well. So I, I uh, got the the cult and I just decided to go for it because it's a more delicate guitar. You know what I mean? Like these. Well, I I got to play that guitar. The guitar is awesome. It sounds great acoustically too. Yeah, it's. <laughs> you know? I mean, I had an old '64, 345, and I got to say, it kicks its butt. Yeah. Like it really does acoustically. Yeah. It's twice as loud. And as well, well, look, Collins. You know, they have they're they're a stellar maker. Yeah. They have a great reputation. Uh, their acoustic guitars are, you know, top of the line. That's I, next. I wouldn't expect anything yeah. less. And, you know, I 
<laughs> uh, we still have a few things we want to buy for the studio. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, maybe next year you call the Collins people up and we get us one yeah. of those. All right, man. Um, why don't you call a tune, play us out. Thank uh, you so much for oh, yeah. Thanks. My pleasure. Know, uh, us interrupting your session and doing this thing and sharing everything with us. The courses are phenomenal. Thanks. What yeah, do you want to play out to? Uh, let's do the slow blues, right? Like, you ever loved a woman, something like that? Okay, cool. Oh, oh always waiting for. <laughs> ready, did oh, you did. Oh, you want to do? Uh, you want to do fast up or slow? What do you think, Brad? Whatever you let's want. Let's do slow. Man. Let's do Whatever slow. One. Sorry, man. All right, just give me one second. All right, all right, all right. All right it's my fault. Here it is. Here okay. It is. <laughs> Live TV. Thank you.